I love it. It's great to see you guys. Let me welcome you again to church. So glad that you guys have joined us today. Uh, last week, we kicked off a short three-week series. We're calling it our Move Refresh series. And what we wanted to, to do is, is just take some time at the top of the year to really refresh the heart and vision behind the Move Initiative. And we also wanted to spend some time celebrating what God has done over the past year while looking forward to what we're believing him to do in the coming year. And so we're gonna get into all that in just a moment, but next week we're gonna close the series out by giving all of you the opportunity to recommit to move. This is why last week, many of you, you got a commitment card. If you didn't get a commitment card and you need one, uh, you can find those in all of our lobbies today. If you're watching online, doing church at home, you can actually access that on our Move website. Uh, the URL should be on the screen, so you can just go there, click on the giving button, and you can access the, the, the uh, commitment card there. Just start looking that over. Uh, but if you remember back to last year, we had an $8 million financial goal. That was given over two years, and all of that money goes into one big fund. So this is not eight million in addition to all the other money we need for all the other stuff. This is eight million total, all right? It's our regular stuff, plus church planting, plus renovations, plus community work. And so again, what we wanna do next week is give you the opportunity to recommit to that goal. For most of you, that just means staying committed. And so you decided on a number last year and you're gonna keep giving that same number through year two. For others, it might mean increasing your commitment. Maybe you're somebody that the Lord has blessed tremendously over the past year in unexpected ways, and you're sitting there looking at your stuff and your money and going, wow, I didn't expect to have this much, and I can do more, and I wanna do more. We would love for you to do more. And so you'll have the chance to do that. And then there are others of you that might need to decrease your commitment. Okay, we understand this has been a really tough year on a lot of people, even financially, and we wanna be sensitive to that. And so if you are someone who would say, you know what, this year uh, it wrecked me, I lost a job, I lost income, there was an amount that I wanted to give and I just don't think I can give it, that is totally okay. Uh, we would just love to invite you to give whatever you can give and just be a part. And so if you need to decrease it, we, we want you to have the chance to do that. And then finally, if you're new, this is your opportunity to get in on year two, okay? Uh, to join the rest of us to make a 12-month commitment and to join in on all that God is doing in and through our church. Finally, I would just say, if you need resources, we have a ton of them. Uh, you can grab them from any of our lobbies or if you're doing church at home, you can email us. One of our team members would love to email those out to you. Uh, just shoot us a note, move at crosspointcity.com and we'll get those to you this week, okay? All right, everybody good? That's all the boring stuff. We're gonna get into the good stuff, but... We gotta get that out of the way first. So what I wanna do as we get started today is pick up where I left off last week. At the end of my message last week, I briefly shared, briefly shared some of the work that we're setting out to accomplish in 2021. And so I wanna go back to that work and I wanna describe in greater detail some of what we're getting ready to do in the coming year. And if you're anything like me, infatuated with the future, you're a dreamer, you can't wait to see what tomorrow holds, you're gonna love this, all right? Um, so first, under community transformation, our big goal is to continue training people in the Great Commission. This call from Jesus to go to all peoples and to make disciples. I need you to know today that our greatest concern here at Cross Point is not seating capacity, but sending capacity. Okay, our greatest dreams have very little to do with how many butts we can get in seats. Our greatest dreams have much to do with how many butts we can get out of seats into the world for the sake of the gospel. And so last year, we started rolling out some learning environments to better equip and train people in how to do that. And this year, we are launching more learning environments in order to train and equip people in how to do that. And so be on the lookout for those, okay? Uh, the better equipped we are in the house, the more effective we'll be outside the house, amen? And so you need to be a part. Um, under church multiplication, our big goal this year is to expand our church planning efforts, primarily here in North America, uh, we have some big plans globally, but obviously COVID has impacted a lot of our ability to go and to do things across the world. And so hopefully that'll change in 2021, but we know that we can at least get started here. So that's what we're doing. The reason for it's really simple. And I shared these statistics last year. I, I thought they would be helpful for some of you who haven't heard them. So I wanna share them again. Right now in the United States of America, 70% of all churches are plateaued or declining. 70% are stuck or they are headed toward the grave. 30% are growing, 
but that includes transfer growth. So I don't like my church. I'm gonna go to the other church. My church stinks. I like the other church better. So that's the church I'm gonna go to. And then here's what's really sad and scary. Only 7% of churches are reproducing and starting new churches. 7%. The reason that's a sad and scary statistic is because it has been proven that the most effective way to reach new people with the gospel is to start new churches. Okay, furthermore, the population here in the US is projected to grow to over 400 million people by the year 2050. And according to the SEND Institute, which is an evangelism and church planting organization, just to keep up with population growth, we need to plant 57,000 new churches in the next 30 years. 57,000 new churches. Right now, we're on pace to plant 9,000 in the next 30 years. And so we have some serious work to do, and we as a church wanna help with that work. And so one of our plans this year is to start a church planning network called Engage Churches. We'd hope to do it last year, but COVID kind of put a stake in that for a little while, but we're off and running again. Uh, We're pulling together several of our friends from The metro Atlanta area, we've got a lot of guys who wanna work together to plant churches together, and so that's coming in 2021. And then secondly, and I'm super pumped about this, we this year are starting a third Cross Point City Church campus in Rome, Georgia. Come on, I know we have some Rome people in the house with us. Uh, This city has been on our hearts for a couple of years now, and so we've just been praying and seeking the Lord. Should we go? Do you want us to go? And after praying and receiving many, many invitations from people in that city, we believe that it's time to go. Uh, Right now, we have 224 people in our database from Rome. And what we wanna do is give those people the opportunity to reach their city with the gospel. So that's coming in the fall of this year. And then finally, under campus renovation, we have three primary goals. Number one, we want to expand parking here in Cartersville which I know is not super exciting, but the truth is before COVID, uh, we were parking all of our serve team across the street at the elementary school and we were still running out of parking. There are people trying to come to church and they're pulling in, no parking spot, and so they're leaving and that is unacceptable. So we have to figure this out, we have to fix that. Uh, Number two, we have a plan to purchase property in Adairsville. We wanna, yeah, Clay's excited about that. And so we wanna keep putting down deeper roots in that community, all for gospel purposes. And so be praying, we're looking for property right now. So if you know someone who has some or you have some that you would like to either talk to the church about buying or just taking off your hands, we would love to talk to you about that, all right? And then finally, finally, and again, this is something that I am so excited and passionate about. Uh, In 2021, we are planning to renovate a ministry center here on our Cartersville campus that we're gonna call the Compassion Center. If you remember back to last year, if you were around, I shared with you a conversation that I had with our county commissioner, our our, uh, school superintendent, and our city mayor. I went to these guys before we ever launched MOVE, and I said, hey, we have 53,000 square feet of building space that we're not sure what to do with yet, but what we know is that we don't wanna use it for us. Like, what we wanna do is renovate it and get it ready so that we can bless the community and serve people who really need hope and who need help. And so I just asked the question, what does the community need? How could we bless the community with what God has given us? And they gave me all kinds of great answers. They said, James, we need more space for counseling. We need more space for addiction help. We need space to mentor kids, to teach adult literacy. They shared that we need more space here to uh, serve the homeless and the underprivileged, a place that they could come to wash clothes, to use a computer, to get help in finding potential employment. And so this year, we're gonna renovate a building on our property, the far side of our property, it's called the Annex, and we're gonna turn that building into this center. In addition to those services, we're also going to provide basic medical and dental services, and we're gonna do that to serve people in this community who are either uninsured or underinsured to get them the help that they need. And the prayer is that this would open the door for the gospel to be shared, amen? And so 2021 is gonna be a huge and exciting year. I'm pumped. We have some great work in front of us. Again, some of you acted like you wanted to celebrate that, and I just wanna give you permission. It is okay to celebrate the work of God, all right? Come on. And so I need to be honest with you, though. As excited as I am about all that God is doing, as excited as I am about the work that's in front of us, here's the honest truth. If we're gonna do that, then you and I have to be willing to make certain moves this year. 
I said it last week, like you and I are gonna have to pray like never before, serve like never before, give like never before, share the gospel like never before. And if we're gonna do those things, we have to be motivated by the same things that motivated Jesus. And so what I wanna do is take us back to John 13 for a moment. We're gonna hang out in a couple of passages today. We're gonna start with John 13 and eventually we'll get to Ephesians 1. So if you wanna save your place in Ephesians 1, I'd love for you to do that. But again, we'll start in John 13. It's in this famous passage where we find Jesus washing the feet of his disciples that we discover the why or the heart behind the move initiative. Okay, it was the night before his crucifixion and he was gathered with these men in a borrowed room and they were sharing in the Passover meal. And at some point during the meal, a fight broke out. The disciples started arguing about which of them was the greatest. Well, in the middle of the fight, Jesus, without saying a word, got up from the table and he went and he got a basin and he filled it with water and he wrapped a towel around his waist and the greatest man in the room, the son of God, assumed the position of the lowliest servant in a household and he got onto the floor and he just started washing feet. Now, the question I've continued to wrestle with since last year when we did this series is why did Jesus wash feet? Why? Why did he do that? Because he didn't have to. If he wanted to in that moment, he could have said, hey guys, you're acting like a bunch of children. I need you to cut it out. None of you are great. I'm great. And I don't know if you've noticed, but my feet are dirty. And in a few hours, I'm dying for the sins of the world. And so I need one of you heathen brothers to get on the floor and to serve me. But that's not what Jesus did. The greatest man at the table instead got onto the floor and he served a bunch of unworthy men. Why did Jesus do that? Well, we find the answer in verse three. Here's what John says. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. And so according to what John writes here, there were three things that motivated Jesus. Authority, identity, destiny. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. That's authority. This is what we talked about last week. If you missed that message, I would encourage you, get on the website, go to the app and watch it. Jesus knew that he had come from God. This is identity. This is what we're gonna talk about and unpack today. And then Jesus knew he was going back to God. That's destiny. That's next week. So make sure you're back from that for, for that, Okay. Because Jesus knew all these things, he made this move. And then later down in the text, he calls you and I to do the same. Starting in verse 12, he looks at his disciples and I believe he's communicating this to us as well. But he said to them, guys, I just set an example for you down there. You call me teacher and you call me Lord and you're right for so I am. Well, here's the deal. If you wanna be like me and if you wanna follow me, then you need to be willing to do for one another what I just did for you. You see, this call from Jesus was for people like you and me to do what Paul describes in Philippians chapter two. Paul says, okay, look, you really wanna be like Jesus? You really wanna follow his example in the world? Here's where you start. Stop making life all about you. It's not about you. Stop putting yourself at the center of the universe and only living for your self-centered desires. But instead, you should count every other person in your life as more significant than you. It goes for your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers and your family members, your spouse, your kids, those strangers at the grocery store. It goes for those people on Facebook that disagree with you on political issues. Like every person in your life is more significant than you. You count their needs as more important than your own. You count their interests as more significant than your own. And you spend your entire life just pouring yourself out for the sake of people, even when you don't want to, and even when they give you reason not to. To hear me on this, if you and I, again, are gonna follow the example of Jesus in that, we have to be motivated by what motivated him. And so in this series, that's what we're talking about, these motivations. And as I said a moment ago, today we're gonna dig into identity. And so let me give you a simple definition if I can. Uh, this won't be on the screens, but if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Identity is simply who you think you are. Identity is simply who you think you are. Your identity is shaped by your values, your traditions, your beliefs, your experiences, your relationships, and it's often revealed in how you present or describe yourself to other people. So for example, if I were to ask you today, who are you? 
Tell me about you. And you said back to me, well, James, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm a student. I'm an athlete. I'm an employee. I'm a musician. Or you started telling me about the work you do, the neighborhood you live in, the car you drive, the money you make, the hobbies you enjoy. Or you talked about that group you're a part of. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm black. I'm white. I'm LGBTQ. Your answers to me would reveal who you think you are. Now, here's the problem for many people. And I would imagine with the number of people joining us for church today, this is probably a problem for some of us. But the problem for many people is this. Who they think they are doesn't align with who God says they are. Who they think they are doesn't align with who God says they are. The reason that's a problem is because if, you, if who you think you are doesn't align with who God says you are, you are building your identity on a faulty foundation. And that means that at any point, something or someone can come along and rip that foundation out from under your feet. And in that moment, your identity shatters. The good news is there's no need for that because God in his grace and kindness toward us, well, he's told us exactly who we are on page one of the Bible. And so I'm gonna read a couple of verses out of Genesis for you. Genesis 1, 26 and, or uh, excuse me, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so from these two verses, we learn three things about who we are. And I wanna give them to you, okay? Number one, we are creatures. We are creatures. Okay, there is a creator and you're not him. You're a creature. God made you. God put you here. You came from him. And I know for a lot of us, that's like a duh, of course we did, but not everyone agrees with us on that. See, there are three primary worldviews that you can adhere to as a human being. One of those is called atheism, which says there is no God. And we came from a single-celled organism that evolved over billions and billions of years. That's why we're here. That's where we came from. Uh, You can adhere to what's called pantheism, where we all get to be God. Everything's God. Uh, The universe is God, and God is the universe, and you're kind of God, and I'm kind of God, and the trees are God, and we all get to share in this God-like existence. Or you can believe in monotheism, Christianity, which says, nope, there's one God. And God created all things, including you. All you are is a creature. Number two, Moses, the author of Genesis, tells us that we are imagers, that we are imagers, that God made us in his likeness and in his image. Now, theologically speaking, that means two things. Number one, that we as human beings are unique amongst creation. Praise God, this is really good news. You are not like your dog. Amen. Yes, I got two dogs at home. They do some weird, gross stuff. I'm just glad I'm not like them, right? As people, we are unique amongst creation. But it also means, secondly, that every human life possesses intrinsic value every life. Doesn't matter age or race or ethnicity. Doesn't matter rich or poor. Doesn't matter born or unborn. Every human life possesses intrinsic value. Why? Because every life was made by God in his image. Practically speaking, being an imager means two things as well. It means number one, that you're here to reveal. So your life has a revelatory function. God created you and he put you in his world to reflect who he is to the world that he made. Secondly, it means that you're here to rule. This is what it means when God says to mankind, I want you to have dominion over creation. And before you get excited about that, like, yeah, I rule. Let me just say to you, that doesn't mean that you get to rule by force. That means you get to rule through service. This means you get to be like Jesus. And you get to use the authority that God has given you as a human being to steward what is rightfully his for his glory and the good of people. But you do understand that nothing belongs to you. One person said, yep. Yeah. Okay, the rest of you, I hope you get it. Like God owns all things and you own nothing. God in his grace has given you some things that he calls you to exercise dominion over for his glory and the good of his world. And the fact that you don't own anything is seen in this truth that you're gonna die one day and nothing is coming with you. It is all his. And then thirdly, you are blessed. So we're creatures, we're imagers, 
and we are blessed. That word blessed there in verse 28, it comes from a Hebrew word that means to praise, but it can also mean to empower. So I want you to visualize this. God creates our first two parents, Adam and Eve, and in this moment of creation, he both praises them and he empowers them. And I want you to note something here. When does God praise them and empower them? Before they do anything for him. It's not like God gives them all this work to do and says, hey, if you do the work well and you do it rightly, then I'll praise you and then I'll empower you. No, God praises and empowers and then he gives work. And this should remind us today that the blessing of God, come on, some of you need this, so hear me. The blessing of God is dependent upon his grace, not your performance. And I know that's different from what some of you think and believe. It's different from what some of you grew up in church hearing. Like you're here today thinking, well, if I do the right thing, God will bless me. And I'm telling you that God blesses you so that you can do the right thing. Again, his blessing isn't dependent upon how you perform. No, God blesses you so that you can perform. This is who you are. You are a creature made in the image of God and that God has blessed you. Now that's really good news, isn't it? All right, now for the bad news. You have a very real enemy called Satan who also has something to say about who you are. And we see what he says about who we are just two chapters later in Genesis three. He comes along and he strikes up this conversation with Eve. And he asks the question, Eve, did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees in this garden? And he says, no, that's not what God said. God told us that we could eat from any tree. There's just this one tree we're not supposed to eat from. We can't even touch it or we're gonna die. And Satan follows that up with this. Eve, you're not gonna die. Come on. God's not gonna kill you for eating. He said, Eve, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree is because he knows if you do, you'll be like him. Okay, think about this. In that moment, what was Satan doing? Lying to her about her identity. The fall that we see in Genesis 3 happened because mankind believed a lie about their identity. In our series last year, I labeled it the lie of potential. In this moment, Satan was planting seeds of doubt in her mind and suggesting to her, Eve, you have the potential to be more than who God says you are. Don't worry about creature status. Don't worry about imaging. Eve, you just be who you want to be. And because she believed this lie and Adam believed this lie about their identity, sin and all of its consequences entered our world and our world's never been the same. Now, here's the sad reality. Satan still feeds this same lie to people today and people still keep believing this same lie today. In fact, I am convinced that potential may be one of the greatest cultural idols of our day. We talk a whole lot about sex. We talk a whole lot about money. I think potential is way up there towards the top of the list. It's why people run themselves in the ground. It's why people are so busy that they can't even do the most important things in life. It's why people crush themselves under the weight of an unnecessary schedule, unnecessary work. They're just trying to be more than who God says they are. Like Satan's in their ear whispering. Don't worry about the whole creature thing. Be creator. Be God over your own life. Don't worry about imaging God. Project the image you want to project. Be who you want to be. Don't worry about being blessed by God, praised by him, empowered by him. Just seek the praise of other people and be your own strength. You have what it takes. This is why in our culture today, people chase after identity in all sorts of things. Status, power, money, sex, gender, you name it. They're doing this because they're building their identity not on who God says they are, but on who Satan says they are. Can I tell you the only way to avoid that? The only way to avoid believing that lie of potential is by knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. You have to know who you are in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago not only as the perfect human, and we know this from the Gospels, we know it from the epistles. Jesus came to do what you and I could not do, what we failed to do, which was to image God rightly in every way, and he did. He was perfect, he was sinless, he was 100% obedient to God all the time. This is why Paul in Colossians 1.15 says that he is the visible image of the invisible God. If you wanna know who God is, just look at Jesus. He's God. He'll show you what God is like. But furthermore, as God, 
Jesus also restored us back to our image bearing purpose. This is such good news. This is the gospel. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus Christ has saved us from the penalty of sin, death. And by faith in him, he has cleansed us, made us righteous, sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And now the Holy Spirit is saving us from the power of sin. Like this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you today. And this is why the ministry of the Holy Spirit matters so much. The Holy Spirit's goal in your life is to rip every ounce of you out of you. He wants to kill your flesh, that part of you that is constantly trying to drag you away from God and towards sin. Like he just wants to put that thing to death because his ultimate goal is to make you like Jesus Christ in every day so that you can image God and your life can serve its God-given purpose. This is why it is so important for you to know who you are in Christ. Okay, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this statement down. When you know who you are, you know what to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. So in other words, when you're clear on your identity, you're clear on your purpose. When you know this is who I am in Christ, you understand this is what God put me on planet earth to do. We see that reality in Jesus. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said to his disciples, again, as they were trying to figure out what it meant to be great, he said, listen, I, the son of man, came here not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so when you read John 13 and you see him the night before his crucifixion going to the floor, that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. That was to be expected. Like I know some of us, we read a passage like that and we go, I can't believe Jesus would do that. We should believe Jesus would do that because that's who he was. And because he knew who he was, he knew exactly what to do in a moment like that. And the same will be true for you if you know who you are in him. When you understand that you are a creature who has been designed by God to image him and he blessed you in order to do that, but your sin has derailed your purpose. And that's why Christ came. Like he came to do for you what you couldn't do so that you can do what God has designed you to do. You don't waste your life doing other things. No, you spend your life imitating Christ by getting on the floor and serving others. Why? Because you know, this is what God put me here to do. So to help you with that, What I wanna do for the rest of our time together is I just wanna help you understand on a deeper level who you are in Christ. And so I want you to flip if if your place is saved over to Ephesians 1. Um, In my humble opinion, one of the, maybe the richest passages in the Bible concerning identity in Christ. It's amazing. And I wish we had more time to spend on this text today. Uh, At some point in the future, we'll preach through the book of Ephesians and we'll move really, really slowly through it. But today what I wanna do is read it and then I wanna just share with you what Paul says about who you are in Christ, okay? So we're gonna pick it up in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Oh, this is so good. Y'all wanna stay for a few hours and we can just... All right, here's, here's the Last week I had 10 points. This week I have 12 points, okay? And so we're gonna fly through them really quickly, but you need to hang in. I wanna, I wanna share with you 12 things, 12 truths about who you are in Christ. And so if you're taking notes, right quickly. Number one, you are blessed. You're blessed. What does that mean? Here's what it means. 
God is for you. He is for you. The God of the universe is with you and in you and around you and he goes before you in all things. He praises you, he strengthens you, he empowers you and it has nothing to do with you. He does it because of his grace and kindness toward you and because of what he's done for you in and through his son, Jesus Christ, every spiritual blessing that could be given by him has been given to you. God is for you, you're blessed. Number two, you're chosen. You are chosen. You didn't choose God, God chose you. And in fact, you couldn't choose God unless God first chose you. See, as people, we are totally depraved, meaning that we are essentially and unchangeably bad apart from the grace of God. And so unless God in his grace initiates, there is no choosing him. He chose us first. Number three, you are holy. You are holy. That word means set apart. And this is exactly what God did for you in Christ. He took hold of you and he set you apart for himself and he decided through this person, I will put my glory and character on display in my world. You're holy. Number four, you're blameless. You're blameless. If you are in Christ, it does not matter what you have done. In the eyes of God, you are no longer at fault for your sin. Like when God looks at you, he sees a person who is not guilty anymore. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he not only cleansed you, but he clothed you in his righteousness. And so when God looks at you, all he sees now is Jesus. You are blameless in his eyes. Number five, you're loved. And I believe some of us need to hear this today. You are loved by God, deeply loved by God. And the ultimate proof of his love for you is the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans 5a, in this, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, I need you to know today that if you're that person who's working for the love of God or worrying about the love of God, you need to stop it and you need to rest in the love of God. If you are in Christ, God loves you on your worst day just the same as he does on your best day because his love for you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what Christ has done for you. If you are in him, you are loved by God. Number six, you're predestined. You're predestined, and I know for some of us that's a scary word. We don't like that word. You should love that word. It's a beautiful word. It's a biblical word. I've had church people over the years tell me, I don't believe in predestination. You have to. It's in the Bible. Like we just read it twice in one set of verses. You can't just like act like it's not there. It's there. You got to do something with it. And so what does it mean to be predestined? It means that before your life ever began, the God of the universe had a predetermined destination in mind for you. And what was that destination? His family. His eternal family. What was that destination? Christ's likeness. That person is gonna be made like my son in every way. And so before your life began, the God of the universe took hold of you and said, you're mine and you're a part of my family forever. How good is that? Number seven, you're adopted. You're adopted. Before you knew Christ, or even in this moment, if you are someone who doesn't know Christ, you are or you were a spiritual orphan. Uh, no spiritual father, no spiritual family. But now today, if you are in Christ, you are a son or daughter in the family of God. The God of the universe who created you in his image is your heavenly father, your spiritual father. Jesus is your big brother. And all of these people are now your spiritual family, which is awesome, unless you have issues with somebody. Like, I would just... I would encourage you, if that's the truth, you should get that right because you're stuck with these people for eternity and that's a really long time. So you might as well figure out how to walk in unity now, amen? You're adopted. Number eight, you're redeemed. You are redeemed. That word redeem means to purchase or to buy back. And in the ancient world, it was often used for slaves. You could actually go to the slave market and redeem a slave. You could buy the slave and that slave would go from one master to you who would be the new master. And this is what God has done for you. God paid the price with the life of his son to buy you back to himself. You see, you're not just like free walking the streets now. 
No, God freed you from the masters of sin, death, hell, and the enemy. And God made you a part of his family. And he is now your father and your new master, which is a really, really good thing. When God rules over you, that leads to joy and life and blessing. It is a good thing to be redeemed by him. Number nine, you're forgiven. You are forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. This is something that I missed for many years as a young Christian. Like I'll never forget 14 years old, I prayed, I put my faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and I thought to myself, awesome, God has now forgiven me for 14 years of sinning. And then I started believing any sin I commit from this point forward, like, well, I just gotta make up for that. And I lived under this constant weight of guilt, shame, condemnation. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. God, I promise I won't do that thing anymore. I promise I'm gonna clean my act up. I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna do better. I promise. And then I just felt like a miserable failure. Can I tell you the thing that freed me up? When I finally came to this understanding that Christ paid my sin debt in full, that changed everything for me. When I started to realize, hold on, I don't owe God anything for my sin anymore because God paid for it all. That lifted the weight of shame and guilt off of me and it motivated me toward greater love and obedience to Christ. And I pray the same would be true for you today because the reality is if you're in Christ, he's already forgiven you for sins you're gonna commit this afternoon. Sins you're gonna commit tomorrow. Sins you're gonna commit 10 years from now have been paid for by him, which should not lead to license. I can do whatever I wanna do. No, it should lead to love for Christ. Obedience, a greater willingness to follow him. Let me give you a few more. Number 10, you're enlightened. You are enlightened. Paul says that God has made known to us the mystery of his will. His will being the uniting of all things in Christ in both heaven and on earth. So he's talking here about God's cosmic plan of redemption. Okay, God's doing something in the world. And it's hard to see at times because our world is jacked and it's chaotic and it's incredibly frustrating. But God right now in present time through Christ is redeeming and restoring all things. This is the hope of the believer. We know this is as worth, this is as bad as it's ever gonna get for us. And there's something out there that's coming and it's gonna be awesome. And so that's what we put our hope in. Here's what Paul's saying. You would have never figured that out on your own. As a creature living in a broken world, you would have never logically concluded that God was doing that. No, God in his grace toward you supernaturally revealed that to you that you might believe. I'll give you two more, okay? You're an heir, number 11. You are an heir. An heir by definition is someone who is legally entitled to someone else's stuff. And that is now true for you when it comes to God's stuff. <laughs> God has adopted you into his family and everything that belongs to him now belongs to you. Not because you deserve it, but because he freely gives it. And then finally, number 12, you are sealed. You're sealed. In the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says the Holy Spirit of God came and he took up residence inside your body. And in that moment, he sealed you. He marked you. He identified you. This one belongs to us now. <laughs> this one is ours. And so the Holy Spirit was a guarantee of sorts, a down payment on all that God promises to give you in the future. This is who you are. And there's something I want you to note about this identity, okay? I've been trying to allude to it along the way, but I just wanna be really clear because I need to know you're getting it, okay? This identity that Paul describes for us in Ephesians chapter one is received, not achieved. Amen. It's received, not achieved, okay? You didn't help God with that. You didn't work your way into that. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to deserve it. No, God in his grace through Jesus Christ gave that identity to you as a gift. And Paul says three times he did it all for the praise of his glory. What does that mean? Well, it means that all that God has done for you isn't just for you. Ultimately, it's for him. That God took hold of you through Jesus and imparted this identity to you so that you would know who you are and do what he put you here to do. You see, when you know that you're blessed by God, you don't waste your life chasing worldly blessings. When you know that you're an heir in the family of God, you don't need anybody else's stuff because you've got his stuff. When you know that you're loved and accepted and redeemed, you don't need the praise and approval of other people because you know the God of the universe thinks well of me. He accepts me, he loves me, I'm in his family. 
When you know that you are holy and blameless and forgiven, you stop living under guilt and shame and condemnation, and you're no longer that person putting in religious effort to make up for past mistakes or to earn the favor of God. No one said, well, you know that this is who you are in Christ, all because of God's grace. You spend your life doing what he put you here to do for the praise of his glory. I'm gonna humble myself before him, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna follow Jesus to the floor and I'm gonna spend my life doing what he did. As I was writing this message this past week, um, I just couldn't help but think back to 2020 and about all the opportunities that God put in front of us to get that right. It was crazy to think about the timing of it all. At the beginning of last year, we did this series, the Move series, and for six weeks, talked about what it would mean to move and what it would cost to move. And man, our church was fired up. I mean, God used that six week series to do some significant things in our lives. And so many of us walked away, I'm in, I'm gonna live my life on the floor. I don't care what it costs me. Like I'm going there with Jesus. And then the pandemic happened and life got crazy. And all of a sudden God started putting in front of us opportunities to test how serious we were. And I wanna praise many of you because many of you got it right. Many of you, oh my gosh, you stepped up and you said, dude, I'm I'm in and you served so selflessly. You got involved in the community, you gave money. I mean, you just gave so freely of yourself. And I cannot tell you how many times over the last year I just prayed and I said, God, thank you for that person. Thank you for those. They know who they are and they're doing what you've put them here to do. I wanna celebrate you. And this is where it gets hard um, because some of us missed it. We just missed it. We launched the initiative. We did the series. We were fired up. God started putting opportunities in front of us. And when we saw what those opportunities would require, we decided, never mind. If that's what going to the floor means for me, then I I think I'm just going to stay at the table. And the year 2020 for some of us turned into a year of political agendas and personal agendas and um, social agendas, all at the expense of Christ's agenda. I mean, we even saw it within our own church family. And I'll be honest and tell you, I debated whether or not to even say all this at the end of the message. But I just felt as I kept preparing that the spirit of God was putting it on my heart to say this and I talked to some people in my life who love me and they said, James, you you have to go there because here's what I know. In a moment like this, I might very well offend some of you out of the church, but I also know as your pastor, I have to love you well enough at times to tell you the truth because it's my job to help you grow in Christ's likeness and maturity. And so when I see things in you and I need you to do the same for each other, when I see things in you that aren't aligning with who Christ has called you to be in the world, I need to help you see that. And so at the risk of offending some of you, I'm gonna say this. I cannot tell you how disheartened I was last fall when we reopened our building, trying to get people back on campus to worship Jesus, to make much of him. And we started reaching out to our serve team and said, hey, we need you guys to come. It's time to get on the floor. It's time to serve. We got an opportunity to minister to people, to serve people for the sake of the gospel. I cannot tell you how disheartened I was to get messages back from people which said, if I have to wear a mask, I will not serve. That, that, that was our simple ask. Um, hey, the pandemic's real. We have had people in our church die from this. And we don't wanna ignore that and act like it's not real. And so out of consideration for others, out of love for others, while you're serving, you don't have to wear the whole time, just while you're serving, would you put a mask on? And, and again, we, we heard from certain people who said, if I have to wear a mask, I will not serve. And all I heard in that moment was this. If that's what's gonna be required of me to go to the floor, I'll just stay at the table. I don't know about you, I'm so glad Jesus didn't say that. Now the cross, oh, really uncomfortable, really inconvenient, nails and beatings, I'm not so sure I wanna do all that. No, Christ said, I'll go whatever it takes, no matter what it costs, no matter how inconvenient it might be, and please hear my heart. This is not me trying to lay a guilt trip on you. We do not do the guilt thing here at Cross Point. I'm just trying to help you see out of my love for you that if there is anything in your life keeping you off the floor, 
And I'm not just talking about a mask. It's way bigger than masks. If there's anything in your life keeping you off the floor and at the table, there has to be one of two things true for you. Either you don't know who you are or you've lost sight of who you are because when you know who you are, you know what to do and you don't let anything standing in the way of doing that one thing. And so here's the really good news. If, if that's you, God has grace for you. <laughs> And so do we, like, we love you. I love you. I want to help you. I want to pastor you, which is what I'm trying to do in this moment. And the invitation then would be this. If that is you, if you're seated at the table for any reason, I want to invite you today to come humbly before God, to confess it, to repent of it, to agree with God on who he says you are so that you can begin to do what God put you here to do. And so wherever we are right now, I want to invite us to bow our heads in this moment. And I want to pray for us. I'm gonna take some time to respond. Father, first and foremost, we wanna thank you for Jesus, for the identity that you have given us in him. God, it is overwhelming (laughs) to think about who we are. It is overwhelming to know that you did that for us. I pray this reality would humble us. It would cause each and every one of us to live every day with a great deal of self-forgetfulness. That we would not be people trying to hold on to certain rights or privileges or conveniences, whatever it may be. But that, God, if there's anything standing in the way of us being like Christ, imitating him in your world, God, that you would show that to us and that we would repent of it and we would submit it and surrender it and that we would live in alignment with our identity. God, my prayer over the next several moments, no matter what room we are in, is that you would meet us where we are, that you would do a work in our lives, that we would leave changed people today. Thank you for your love and your grace and your kindness toward us. God, help us by the power of your spirit to live in light of that each and every day. God, we give you praise. We give you praise.